What's up, Gwenters? Uh, <clears throat> I've been rethinking about my role in Gwent. And, you know, I did this with uh, beginner's videos a while ago, and I really enjoyed doing it. And I know a ton of people haven't watched those, but they're super helpful to new people. And if we want Gwent to survive, we need more new people playing the game. They're just... All video games have attrition. It's just true. Uh, I have noticed a lot of people that I've enjoyed playing with over the last couple years uh, have their Gwent play has come to a screeching halt and I think a couple of things have been missing from the Gwent community. Number one, uh, funny content. There hasn't been as much, you know, great dandelion shows going on lately. That Mr. Hobble has gone offline as he's in school. Uh, there hasn't been very much funny stuff. Uh, and I'm gonna try to work my way up there and do some funny content too. Uh, Plain Talk John has really taken over and he's done a really great job with kind of bridging some of that funny content gap. Uh, but one thing that really definitely has been missing uh, since Jagras and Apero stepped out has been new player content. And uh, Mr. Hobla did this kind of as, um, as meme worthy stuff, but reviewing cards. And I think for new players, uh, there's a great chasm of understanding of what the cards do and what's good and what's good in a vacuum so what i want to do today something a little bit different from what we've done in the past is go over the top cards from each of the factions i mean do the best gold card and the best bronze card uh now obviously there are some criteria for this we're going to have the basic criteria for this be all else equal now what does that mean that means no leader considerations no synergy considerations, including devotion. <clears throat> that basically also means no scenarios, uh, because scenarios require cards to proc the different chapters of the scenario. Uh, so that's you know that's kind of a big deal. Um, the one exception that we'll have to this all else equal is syndicate. Uh, well, we we will take coins into consideration. Just there's no way to play syndicate. Uh, without respect to coins, except for maybe Fire Swarm, but then you need to have a whole bunch of synergy for Fire Swarm. Um, and that's really the only only uh, operating deck archetype that works without when you can just ignore coin count. And even then, that's not totally true. Uh, but also, the other point to that, I think a lot of this will help new players, and Syndicate is not a new player archetype. You don't even start with any cards for Syndicate. People who are just starting out the game shouldn't play Syndicate till they've played everyone else first, in my opinion. Um, but they should be slowly building those decks as they open kegs. They're going to get options that include Syndicate cards. And you as a new player should know which one's better. Now, if you have gotten this far and you are a seasoned player, uh, hang around. I want to hear your con uh, your criticisms, ideas, thoughts, feedback, etc. on all these suggestions I'm about to make. Because you're probably going to disagree with me on some of them. And I think it's healthy and helpful for us to have those public disagreements, especially for the new player community. So, with all of that said, let's start with neutrals. And what I'm going to do here, you can do this in Deck Builder. And if you're a new player, go watch my Deck Builder video to figure out how to get here. Uh, and then you can just come in here and click on the faction. Uh, the, um, and if you're on mobile, it'll be down in the bottom left will be all the filters. Uh, but on PC, it's much easier to just click Faction. We're going to click Neutral. These are all the cards. Um, I will say this. Uh, I have a few thoughts I'm going to share at the end about kind of all the factions generally and Gwent generally and my thoughts on Gwent generally. So first and foremost, I would say... For neutrals, there is one card above all else, and that is Oniro. Oniro doesn't play for any value itself, but it is massive value. This is the first card you should create as a new player. Everyone should be making Oniro. You really shouldn't even be thinking twice about it. It's the best card overall, period, full stop. Now, it's an Echo card. If you've never played with an Echo card as a new character, as a new player, that means when you get to play it, when, when you draw it, you get to play it once, and then it will go into your discard, it'll go into your trash, your discard pile, and it will say, uh, it will get doomed on it, and it will go back onto your deck at the beginning of the next turn. Technically, it goes back onto your deck, and then it gets doomed. Um, 
which matters for like lippy decks, but don't worry about that if you're new. Just know that you get to get it twice, and once you play it the first time, it will go back on top of your deck, which means you will draw into it. Also notably, it doesn't go back on top of your deck until the end of your turn, so it can't be milled, um, but it can be uh, deleted from the trash by like a squirrel. Uh, rare, but does happen. Especially this season, there's a lot of trash interaction stuff, so people do want to get at it. All right, so uh, Oniro, 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 Oniro. I, I don't think there was. I looked through all the cards. Uh, you know, Shoop and Siana and Radea are all good value, but they require they have too many trigger requirements. Notably for Radea and Shoop, they can't have any duplicates in your deck. Dandelion Poet is just too slow for 11 provisions, even though he does get you a little bit of consistency. He's worse than most other draw cards, or play a card, or other tutors. Um, Triss requires special synergy with bronze uh, special cards. And you can run into troubles depending on what the opponent plays. Uma's Curse is just a big dice roll. Scorch will oftentimes ruin your own stuff as much as it'll ruin your opponent's stuff. And Renew is limited only to 9 provision units or less, so it's really not all that great. So, that was basically kind of the top of the deck. You know, there's other things down low that you might find have, have like a good return on investment for provisions. Carlo Varis is one that's been recommended to a lot of new players for a long time. Personally, I don't think he's all that great. Um, I would rather see players investing in Onero. Um, and then some other cards further down. I feel like Triangle within a Triangle is good value for a new player. Um, Matahuri is good value for a new player, um, but those were kind of my initial reactions. Now, to bronzes, one thing you can do here is you can always come down and click on bronzes. You probably won't ever need to do that, just fit the provisions you can fit and go with that. Uh, but I did pick Bone Talisman. Bone Talisman is probably the most no-nonsense no uh, bronze card. It's going to boost all allied units by one on, on both rows. Uh, you can usually get that value pretty easily, but it plays better in long rounds and it plays really well with Swarm, but you don't need it with those. It just usually always finds value. Um, so I think it's a good card to invest in. It's also notably uh, like the lowest tier. It only costs 30 scraps to craft it, so it's really cheap for you to get as a new player. Just keep that in mind. All right. Filtering back. Next up is Skellige. We're going to go in the order of how I do videos. Morkvar Mondays, Tamarian Tuesdays, uh, Wild Hunt Wednesdays, Thirsty Thursdays for Nilfgaard, uh, Firestorm Fridays, and, Scoia and Squirrel Saturdays for Scoia'tael. So I think uh, I did actually change back and forth between a few cards, but rested pretty firmly here on Hemdall. Hemdall is just he plays down for eight, and then you can usually always get four points of damage. Uh, there's usually four cards on a single row for the opponent, especially when you're playing higher up on ladder as a newer player. Uh, he waxes and wanes with the meta. Um, you know, he hasn't been as used with Melusine, uh, just because the rain is so much value, but Skellige's really struggled in the last couple seasons anyway, so I wouldn't even use that as a good baseline for how good they are doing, or how well he plays. Just know that he's pretty good value. And then with respect to bronze cards, now, uh, I, w I think that for most decks, Uncred Greatsword is probably the best value, but he does require some synergy because he will only play down for four points. Uh, alternatively, especially in terms of provision cost, Bear Witcher and Drone Berserker both play for eight points. And if you have additional heals or boosts, they can play for even more. So they play, they synergize with a bunch of other cards in the Skellige archetype with a bunch of different leader abilities, but they just play for eight points straight up. No worries, no fretting. Now, they both have pros and cons to those eight points. Bear Witchers, for example, have to be at Adrenaline 4, meaning that it has to be uh, the fifth card or less played out of your hand in a round. Um, and then, uh, but he does do three targeted damage to one specific unit. Drummond Berserker is only going to do two damage before he transforms into Bear Abomination, and it is random, but it will happen automatically. You don't, you can play him as your first card played without any sweat about whether or not he'll find value. Obviously, you'd want to do that on red coin so that the damage hits something from the opponent. 
uh, but he he's always finding value. I think that these two are kind of unilaterally some of the best Skellige cards from season to season. Uh, and pretty pretty reasonable gets. Moving on to Northern Realms. All right, so for Northern Realms, uh, so many of the cards require some kind of synergy. I'm loving Drog right now, but it does require humans. Most of the Northern Realms are humans, but I, you know, we set ground rules, so we're abiding by those. So I think the best card overall, if you're a brand new player and you're buying one Northern Realms card, I would recommend Erland of Larvik. Erland boosts all units in your deck by one. If you play him at Adrenaline 3, he gains immunity, and he can still use his order, so he can't be targeted by anything except for like Scorch, Curse of Corruption, uh, Igni, things that don't target a specific unit but instead destroy like the highest unit or the highest unit on a row um so he can be targeted by things like that but you don't actually even have to use that order for him to find his value you can just play him really early in round one and the six cards that you draw into over rounds two and three will all be boosted by one uh and the you know they'll be pre-boosted to get some of those inspired procs uh, that that a lot of Northern Realms cards have that they also feed into like a Queen Meave, they feed into Vizigar. There's a whole bunch of cards that he synergizes really well with, um, but you don't even need to take those into consideration to know that he's just really good value. Uh, he is one of the best 2-0 cards in the game in my opinion, uh, just because if you can win round one in round in, and force a short round two, he boosts all of those extra cards in the deck and he's getting back an additional three points because you're not drawing three more cards into round three. So he is exceptionally good at that. Uh, also really good with Arch Griffin, a lot of people like him, but uh, I don't, I'm not totally sold on that synergy. Now for bronzes, uh, I had a really hard time picking. I do think the newest cards, specifically Eratusa Student and Bernard Student are two of the best bronzes that are available just because they ramp up in value. You don't need to play anything else for them to find value. Uh, but they're both four provision cards. They do get removed rather easily. Uh, and I was having a hard time deciding which one of them was better because they both kind of require synergies, the archetypes. And I remembered that you don't have to choose. Instead, you can use Rune Word. Rune Word is actually really good right now. I think all decks should utilize it that are using, especially if they're using the Mage Archetype. But honestly, it's just like all round solid card right now for Northern Realms. It is six revisions, so it is kind of costly, but you're getting a free shield onto a Mage choice uh, that is three different options. And if we come in here and we type in Mage, you'll see that there's not actually that many options. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven options. So you can get three of these seven options uh, and you get to choose whichever one is best for you. Uh, Eratusa Adept, uh, Eratusa Student, Banard Student, and Sentry and Spellweaver are all really solid choices, which gives you four out of the seven options. Uh, Sentry and Enchantress, if you get two of them, is fairly good. Banard Tutor is probably the worst. And then Damned Sorceress, can't target herself so that's a little annoying um so even so when you're giving herself that shield she can't go up to, although i have to double check that i haven't played it in a while last time i tried it she couldn't target herself but if she could target herself then she's a seven point play with rune word because she gets that shield herself and she does have that two turn cooldown and you can strip those shields off opponent units so even she's not the worst option here so you do get a lot of uh, and, and it is a flexible card in that some games where there's uh, the opponent doesn't have a lot of removal, you can go for Eratusa Student or Banard Student. Uh, other games where there is a lot of removal, you can just set a Shielded Sentry and Spellweaver and play some Patient Spells. Notably, if you're playing, if you play a Sentry and Spellweaver and then play your second Rune Word, you'll be playing a spell and then you'll be creating a Mage and playing the Mage and he'll get two charges. So, rather strong uh, synergy with those two that I really liked and enjoyed. Northern Realms needs some love. I hope it comes as we see the last piece of this expansion roll out. Moving on to Monsters. Uh, well, there's only one mage there. Monsters. Uh, Alright, so there are a bunch of cards for Monsters. I actually kind of had a hard time choosing but a lot of them require some synergy and a lot of knowledge going into it. I think like Spear Tip's probably the, 
the easiest dumb play, but he doesn't have a ton of upside, and he does exactly meet his he does exactly meet his provision cost, uh, and he doesn't have like veil or shield or anything. He's just a big body. Uh, she who knows is really strong with that resilience give, uh, but it does require Sabbath, um, and that can be a little bit tricky. V is very specific. Keltolus is very specific. Unseen Elder requires devotion. Mamuna and Bloody Mistress require a lot of synergy. Oberon requires synergy. So that's why none of these top ones were chosen. So I know that there's somebody in the comments that's going to be like, oh no, this one. Uh, they were just ruled out based on our criteria. Ikrin is my choice. Uh, Ikrin is solid in a lot of decks. Ikrin is just straight up points. The only tricky thing about Ikrin is that... Uh, it wants to be played early, which doesn't work with a ton of Thrive decks. Just because you're kind of leveling up those Thrive numbers and you want the big 13 point play late. But, uh, you know, and you don't want its armor getting removed. But if you had like a consume down on the board, you could drop down Ikarin and then immediately consume it. That is an option. Just note that you can never play this as the last card from your hand. It will automatically destroy itself. But it is massive value, plays 13 for 10, uh, and you don't have to do anything at all for it other than avoid playing it last. Um, and it does synergize with my next pick, which is Andrega Larva. Andrega Larva are hands down the best monster bronze, in my opinion. Um, you know, like, Griffin is good, Self Eaters are good, uh, Ancient Foglets aren't bad, but they all require some kind of synergy setup. Uh, Gun Kane, same situation. Uh, Conquerors require the devotion setup. Kikimore workers only have three armor now. So I think, uh, in terms of return on your investment for provisions, and Dragolarva are still very much the best. They are two each, and they spawn an additional copy. So when you play this, it plays four for six. But the next card you play, so long as it's a three or higher, pushes them both up to three. You can keep going. It's kind of a brainless play. Thrive is a super easy archetype to get used to. Uh, and technically this requires synergy, but uh, any player with a moderate sized brain can figure out how to count um, and just count their way up. Uh, there are very few cards that are less, that are two or less in monsters anyway, like even like Yotun is a three, Wyvern's a three, even if you're playing them at like base value, Ghoul has to consume something, so he'll come out at larger than one. It's really just like Drowners and Neckers that are the only ones that won't boost that Thrive uh, to make it reach its provision count. So, uh, well, and Nagelfar's crew too. Uh, but, you know, if you're just playing some basic entry-level cards that you got from your Monster Starters deck, uh, and Dragon Larva are going to be a super helpful add to your collection that are going to get you a lot of return on investment in virtually any archetype for monsters moving on to Nilfgaard thirsty Thursdays all right Nilfgaard is super tricky to like make a list for just because so many of theirs require some kind of synergy but we're gonna start with the bronze with them just because I've talked about it so many times you guys already can foresee this coming but hands down the best bronze in Nilfgaard is Blightmaker Blightmaker is ridiculous Blightmaker Gets you crazy value with Mage Assassins, but let's just say you don't have a Mage Assassin. Just pick a Mage that's going to spawn a three-point Guardian, and you move that Mage to the top of your deck. He right there plays for seven points. Cool for him. Super awesome. Uh, now, remember how I told you that Oniro was the best neutral card you should make? Well, Blightmaker can top deck your Oniro, making it so you draw it in the next round. And when he does that, he creates a Cow Carcass that will kill itself and poison two units which is also really good value. So Blightmaker is not only really good value with a couple of cards, um, notably Mage Assassin, uh, and I know some people will be like, oh, you need to treat this in a vacuum. I am, I'm ignoring the Mage Assassin proc here. He still is phenomenal value, being able to top deck either, uh, and also technically you can top deck any card you want. You're just getting really good value off of mages and the special cards, but you can top deck any unit you want. Uh, which is phenomenal uh, synergy. The only other card that kind of gets close to this is Nogglefar, 
for monsters, um, but Nogglefar is only for golds, and it's uh, one of two choices. So you, if you had like 10 golds in your deck, you're only gonna, going to get 20% of those options available to you, whereas Blightmaker lets you choose whatever the heck you want. He's a little broken, still. Oh, uh, now for golds. Uh, I spent a long time looking up and down this list trying to figure out, okay, what's actually the best option here? Most of these require some kind of synergy. I did think like Usurper was probably the one that I was almost the very close to choosing. Uh, but as I scrolled through and thought about Return for Provisions, uh, Ana Henrietta, I think, is actually one of the best, most flexible, nonsense cards where you're able to play your leader ability, usually for somewhere between 5 to 10 points, sometimes 12 if you've done like a full enslaved synergy, um, all the way up to, uh, to, tw to a 6 point steal, then you're taking 6 and giving yourself 6, which is a 12 point play. So you get to do that, and then you get to steal whatever your opponent's ability is. And now some of them, uh, like Pincer Maneuver for Northern Realms, will be a little bit painful. So note that like uh, Pincer Maneuver, draw a Northern Realms card of your choice, then shuffle a card from your hand back to your deck. But you do get to spawn two Volunteers with it, so it's still worth four points. So and I would say Pincer Maneuver is the outlier. Uh, Stockpile gives you three of these Volunteers, so you get six of them. And then all the rest of Northern Realms are great on all Nilfgaard cards. Scoia'tael's are all pretty good except for Precision Strike. But even this gets you a 5 point removal. Um, uh, even Call of Harmony gives you a 7 point unit. So you're getting at least 4 points. But most things are going to give you 6 to 10. Um... Blaze of Glory would be the only other one that like really burns you. Move a Skelga unit for your deck to the graveyard, then damage an enemy unit by its power. Uh, and then some of the Syndicate coin decks are also could burn you a little bit, but you see them a lot less frequent on the ladder. So, you know, just in terms of percentage chances of good return on investment, Ana Henrietta is fairly straightforward, really fairly easy to use, doesn't take a whole lot of synergy in your own deck, uh, although she does usually play best with Assimilate. Um, or with some kind of stealing archetype like Isbel or uh, Viper Witch or Alchemist, but you don't need them. Now, uh, again, Usurper Officer would be my next best se uh, selection here, uh, but he does play, uh, you know, if you're playing in a non-devotion deck, he just plays 12 for 12, which isn't awesome, um, but he does always do it, whereas on, her, on a Henrietta, if you queued up against Blaze of Glory, theoretically you could just play for those three points um, if you don't have anything that's stealing stuff from your opponent's deck or anything like that. Um, the last one that I would say is Yen's, Yennefer's Invocation. Uh, being able to just take the highest powered unit, even if it's something you don't want, and put it on top of your own deck is really good value. But I think about it like with this uh, Ana Henrietta, you could do Yennefer's Invocation onto an onto a Judah, then you could play on a Henrietta uh, onto a Blaze of Glory, and then use the Blaze of Glory to do the damage with the with the Judah for 12 points of damage. Uh, being bada boom, you get really good synergy there. So that would be those were kind of my options. Nilfgaard again has a lot of choices, none of which are super great uh, in a vacuum, just because they rely on too many other things. Uh, Damien would be the other option here that's really similar to Ana, but he usually has a problem sticking in my experience, meaning that like he usually gets locked or uh, damaged off the board, so that's why I didn't recommend him right up front. But he is also another great card that I would recommend new players get, same with Joachim. Enough about Nilfgaard. Uh, Syndicate. Syndicate is next. Okay, Syndicate. We had to take Syndicate in the vacuum plus the inference that you would have coins at some point and you would be developing coins. Again, Syndicate is not for the faint of heart. You can watch some of my videos about how to play it. Uh, we, uh, the only deck, like I said early on in this video, it doesn't rely on coins as Firesworn. And Firesworn really requires a lot of synergy. So like Ulrich, for example, needs a bronze Firesworn target to be worth more than three points as a simple Intimidate engine. So 
rather trash. He's also a devotion. He also really needs his devotion for the boost two to proc onto Fallen Knight for it to stick on the board, uh, which is also why I didn't choose Fallen Knight once we get down there. So just to answer all those questions. Now, Bounties is very much the same situation. You need to have a lot of synergy here. Professor is good, but a 6 plus 4 point removal for 12 provisions is actually not great. What you're really getting with him is that Bounty proc with the coin return. Um, but we're not really factoring in the Bounty procs with coin returns for future cards because that's relying on synergy. Instead, we're just saying, okay, we're going to assume that we're getting coins and able to spend those or use those in some other way. And with that inference, hands down, best card, in my opinion, especially if you're new to, to Syndicate, is Philippa Eilhart. Philippa has been in and out one of the most dependable Syndicate cards. And although she's not superbly in the meta right now, she very much could be. I think people are just playing new cards, new archetypes to mix it up and have some fun with it. But uh, being able to seize a nine point unit from your opponent with nine of your own coins is an 18 point play plus the three points she brings so she can easily play for 21 points. Usually she plays for around 13. I'm usually stealing fives or sixes with her, um, but those cards often are engine cards or they are engine prevention cards, meaning that it's like a tunnel drill where the opponent is gonna delete all your own stuff. So you go ahead and steal it over to your side so that they can't use it even though you might not be able to use it. So you are usually saving additional value with Philippa, uh, often upwards of uh, 10, 15, 20 points that she prevents. So she plays typically in my experience for massive value. There's never been a time where I've had Philippa and felt like, oh man, that was a bad play. There's some times where I feel like I only am able to hold over three coins, but it's she still, even if you only have three coins to spend, is going to play for nine points. That's because she plays down for three, you're taking three from the opponent, and you're putting three on your side. So even in the worst case scenario, she's still playing for nine. Uh, if you have zero coins, then I'm sorry. The, I know we're playing in a vacuum without respect to leaders, but all of the leaders give you coins. Make sure to save your coins for Philippa if you're really worried about coins. I mean, the worst is congregate at three coins, which is why I'm saying three coins base. Everybody else gives you coins. Okay, Pirate's Cove doesn't give you coins. Don't play Pirate's Cove ever. That's my number one suggestion. <laughs> um, uh, I don't care how much Freddy Babes likes it. It's a trash leader ability. It just is. Uh, cool. Now, last but not least, Scoyatel. Oh, wait, uh, for bronzes. So I really had a hard time with bronzes. I think one of the reasons Syndicate really struggles as I kind of go through this list is that they struggle with bronzes. Every time, bronzes are the things that get nerfed for Syndicate for some reason. Um, and they just have a bad complement of bronze cards. Um, I certainly can't recommend a poison because it would require two poisons, which is a card synergy. Uh, I really struggled recommending any of the crimes just because they typically have synergy with intimidate engines or like lined pockets where you're getting an additional coin for every time you play them or they need like a, a or like a fire swarm uh, synergy going on uh, so I couldn't recommend any crimes for that reason a five point removal for five point for five provisions that gives no extra benefit is not actually all that great yes this extra coin for excess damage is some nice flexibility but it's not as good as nature's rebuke and i i'm not recommending that for scoyatel so i wanted something on par and i think the best thing if you're brand new and you have nothing else a failed experiment is actually pretty good value plays 10 for 5 even if you have no coins he's going to go down to 9 uh, and he'll keep losing value, but he usually is playing for at least eight points, which is uh, on par with those other cards we saw from uh, Skellige that I recommended, notably uh, the Drawn Berserker and the Bear Witcher. So those guys are playing for eight. He's playing for ten sometimes, often nine. Usually worst is eight points. Uh, and if you're feeling like it's going to be a pinch scenario, just hold him for final play. 10 points is still a reasonable final play, especially when you're high up on ladder as a new player. Uh, I think you'll get a lot of traction out of him. Uh, it's super ugly. Deal with it. Don't do the premium version. Then you don't have to listen to him screaming and squelching every time you play him. Uh, 
and he does have a lot of internal synergy with coin gaining cards if you have like uh, if you have a tax collector, watch my video about row placement. Just make sure to put the failed experiment after the tax collector. The tax collector will gain a coin. The failed experiment will take the coin, and they will both balance each other out uh, and maintain that power level there. So, uh, but I do think point slam with reductions is more valuable as a new player than cards that have increasing point value, like uh, Sly Seductress, for example, or Intimidate Engines. So. Um, or uh, the other one that I was really thinking about here was Townsfolk. Uh, they are very good. I do love Townsfolk. They have some amazing synergy with other cards like Igor, Tax Collectors, um, you know, all those things. But I think that they do require some synergy and they are a little clunky to play for your first few times. Scoyatel rounds us out. Uh, Okay, so Great Oak has typically been the one that most people have recommended as your first card. Great Oak is a phenomenal card. Uh, I would have, or rather, is a really straightforward card to play. A lot of the other Scoyatel cards require some synergy, whether it be the Dwarfs, the Elves, uh, a self-boosting hand, uh, whether it be special cards with Francesca, Elves with Fernwazil, or nature cards with Ethne. They all require some kind of synergy with other cards, so I couldn't recommend any of them except for Great Oak or my personal preference is Gezrus. Now you'd be in a fine position to take both of these cards, but Gezrus does everything that Great Oak does but better, and he does it for four turns because you play him as the fourth card from your hand because he's Adrenaline 3. So he's going to boost all of the... If you put him in melee to start, he'll boost your range draw, all units in your range draw twice, and then when he goes to melee, he'll damage all of the enemy units in the melee row twice. So, uh, fantastic value that you're getting off of him. Basically, Great Oak times four if he sticks. Um, personally, I would recommend doing some kind of boost value with him, some kind of ordered unit that can boost him, hand boost that can boost him. But Scoyatel has a lot of those options now, and I think we're going to see even more as this next expansion rolls forward. Um, so note that that's good. He plays really well against Swarm. He plays really well with Swarm. He likes long rounds, uh, and he's reasonably good in a short round with the Adrenaline, even though he's not boosting or helping as many units. He's still pretty good. And Scoyatel leader abilities have multiple leader abilities that spawn units. Um, just to walk you guys through, I know we're playing this in a vacuum, but Guerrilla Tactics plays really well. You can move all the stuff back to the range row so you can boost it all. Or you can move all of the opponent's stuff from the range row to the melee row so he can damage it all. Invigorate gets him that self-boost. Uh, Nature's Gift is going to proc those Treants every time you play a Nature card. Precision Strike gives you at least one Sentinel, but usually you're building in the other two to get the other two out. So that plays really well on range row with him. Deadeye Ambush gives you Elves you can spawn that he can play well with. Call of Harmony even gives you a unit you can play. Mahakam Forge is really the only one that has doesn't have great synergy with Gezrus. So, uh, you know, I, I, we are playing in a vacuum away from leader abilities, but knowing that all of the leader abilities work with him make him a no-brain play for me. Uh, you do need to make sure there's room for him to move back and forth on, uh, but even if he can't move, he'll stay on the same row and continue doing that row effect. So you can actually like lock him out of range by having your toll range row full and continuing to damage the opponent's melee row over and over again. That is actually an option for him. Now for bronzes, and honestly this is taken in light of Gezrus and also the fact that Scoyatel struggles with bronzes. They don't have a lot of great bronzes that play well in a vacuum. Sorcerers of Dolbothana, Elven Seers are really good examples of that. You really need bronze special cards to both boost them and to play on them to replay them again uh so i think in a vacuum the best cards i would recommend would probably be crushing trap but my number one is hawker smuggler being able to carry over points one carryover point is worth two points played in a round in my opinion just because you can decide how long you want to keep playing in a round for uh, and you can drag out rounds or win them and press the opponent out and save up a hand-boosted unit to play for a whole bunch of value in a future round as a lot of point slam. We've all seen how Gord does that with specials. Well, Hawker Smuggler can do that with a couple of different cards. Aglaïs and, um, and our good friend, oh my gosh, Mr. Dwarf, Sheldon Skaggs. 
are two really good examples of that, but there's a lot of other boost cards that are coming into the game uh, with the Snake expansion, so I did want to highlight that. Uh, it also plays really well with Gezrus. It plays well with the other cards you want to stay on the board, so Gezrus can keep boosting them. Uh, the Hogger Smuggler has perennially been one of my favorites, and I think will continue to find value as Scoia'tael continues to develop. That's it. That's my list. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Now, a couple of thoughts I wanted to share just about Gwent in general. Candidly, there hasn't been very much power creep, right? A lot of these cards I have suggested have been all the way from Iron Judgment with a Garen. Uh, Hemdall, I think, is actually base game. Um, let's just double check. Yeah, Hemdall is a base game card. Uh... Rune Word is a base game card for Northern Realms. There were a couple of Way of the Witcher cards I've suggested. Hawker Smuggler is also base game. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of Way of the Witcher, but that happened back in December, January period. It's been a long time, friends, since Way of the Witcher. Uh, and candidly, I think that this might be part of the problem with Price of Power expansion, especially coming in three chunks. They aren't making the top of this list. They require so much synergy that although they're getting a lot of play and playing for a lot of value right now, they're not played by beginner players. And if they are, the beginner players are having bad experiences with them because they don't play that well. Um, and they take a lot. There's a huge learning curve for figuring out how to play them. And I know that a lot of people will hate on power creep, but I think it's what keeps games alive, candidly. It's what keeps people playing games. It's what keeps people investing into the game because they feel like, oh, this next thing's going to help me accomplish X, Y, Z. And I think that we need to see some single player content where we can fiddle with these cards, have fun with them on their own, and where power creep will make a, uh, a difference and impact in rewards and play style all that stuff so those are my thoughts let me know what you guys think in the comments down below and next time until next time good luck out there keep on gwenting um, bye bye for now